Hey folks, uh, continuing our notes here from the tangent line problem. So kind of the, the basis of all of differential calculus is this ability to find the derivative. So we have what's called the modified form of the limit definition. I don't know how important I would make this. Um, so what this is talking about, this is an option. This finds the numeric value of the derivative, okay? So, I mean, if you want to memorize this, you can. I don't think I would bother memorizing it because we already kind of did this. The other option, if I want to find the numeric value of the derivative, that means I want to figure out what the derivative is, let's say, at x equals 6. So what I can do is I can find the derivative and then plug 6 into that derivative equation or plug 16 in or plug 27 in. What this does for us, this eliminates the need to plug it in afterwards. We start off by directly subbing in what x equals c, or sorry, when x, yeah, yeah, whatever x equals c is, I would plug those in and then evaluate from there. So I'm going to do this example using the modified form, but if you don't memorize this, I wouldn't, I don't think that it would cost you too much in the long run if you don't memorize it because you could still find the derivative by definition. You'd get an equation for the derivative, and then you could just simply plug in that x value for x in the derivative equation. But we'll try it. We'll try it. Okay, so we want to find f prime of 1, which would equal then the limit. So here's our function. We want to find the derivative at, x, uh, at 1. So I want to find the limit. As h approaches 0, so here we are again, and the setup is instead of being f of x plus h minus f of x, it just, you plug in the number right away for x. That's the only difference. So this formula and the difference quotient are the exact same thing. You just plug in the, the number for x right away. So like I said, well, I'll just quit, quit repeating myself. So this would be f of 1 plus h minus f of 1 all over h. Okay, so now we can start to clean this up. We can start plugging in a chugging. So we would get the limit as h approaches 0. Okay, f of 1 plus h. That means everywhere there's an x, I'm going to replace that with 1 plus h. So I would have 1 plus h over 1 plus h plus 1 minus f of 1 means I plug in 1 to these. So that would be 1 over 1 plus 1 all over h. So from here, there's a couple things you can do. I would start to clean things up is how I would attack this. So I would have the limit still as h approaches 0 of 1 plus h over, and I can put these 1s together. I, I'm going to put the h first. I guess it kind of goes the opposite of what it looks like on top, but that's the way I'm choosing to do it. Minus 1 over 2 all over h. All right, now hopefully at this spot your math voice is screaming something. This is all that practice that we did with limits. This is where we can start to apply that again. So I'm looking at this and I'm saying, all right, what can I do to try to clean this up? Stop and think on your own first of what you would do. Pause it if you need to. You should be able to recognize the first move here. Pause it if you need to. All right. Hopefully you came up with it. Let's see how you did. So I'm looking at these two fractions. I want to get them together. To get them together, I need to make them have a common denominator. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply by 2, h plus 2. And then whatever I do to the top, I've got to do to the bottom. Now, I guess I shouldn't have said common denominator. What I should have said is clear out these fractions. So I want to times by something that will cancel the h plus 2 and the times by something that will at the same time cancel the divide by 2. So equals, equals, we still haven't plugged in 0 for h, so I have to write the limit out. And then I'm going to distribute this. Remember how this works. This is going to end up on the top here. The h plus 2 part is going to cancel out. I guess I could kind of write it here. So I'm going to have a 2 and an h plus 2, and I'm going to have a 2, and I'm going to have an h plus 2. Now in this case, the h plus 2 part is going to cancel out, and I'm left with 2 
plus 2h. And then here, the, the 2 part is going to cancel out. Now, don't forget you've got this negative to deal with. So that's going to be minus h minus 2 all over. And then the denominator didn't get, got kind of messed up. 2h times h plus 2 after I times those. Now, remember, when you multiply, you don't just, I'm just multiplying h times 2, which is 2h. If I wanted to distribute, I could, but I'm going to see if things cancel. Everything in the numerator, just like what we did over here, everything in the numerator without an h should cancel out. So the same thing happens here. 2 minus 2 cancels out. And I have something that I can now combine. 2h minus h is 1h over 2h times h plus 2. And finally... Never not first. I wanted to plug in all along. I've been wanting to plug in zero, but it's been causing a zero on the bottom and a zero on the top. So I haven't been able to do that. Now that I've got an H on the top and an H on the bottom, I can finally kill off the part that was causing me the problem when I plugged in zero, and I can actually plug in zero. That's going to leave me with a one over that zero. That's two. Two times two is four. So in other words, what we could now say is that f prime of 1 is 1 fourth. That means that the slope of the tangent line at x equals 1 has a slope of 1 fourth. That means that the curve f is changing at a rate of rise 1, run 4 at that specific pot, spot, x equals 1. Okay, now the next part, part B. Find the equation of the normal line. So there's a couple of things that I want you to start to get in the habit of. Anytime you see find the equation, I want you to write down the two things that you must know to write an equation. I'm going to give you 10 seconds to write, 5 seconds to write down those two things. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. What are the two minimum things we need to write an equation? I need to know the slope and I need to know the point. Those are the two things we must know. Now, as it turns out, what do we know about the slope? The slope turns out to be, well, related to the derivative. And then the point is based on the x number. So we already have half the battle. We talked about this in, I don't remember what unit it was, a while back. We talked about what the normal line is. So let's talk now, let's review now, I should say, what the normal line means. The normal line is perpendicular to the tangent. The normal line is perpendicular to the tangent line. So what do we know about the tangent line? What do we figure out up here? Tangent line at x equals 1 has a slope of m equals, okay, what's the slope of the tangent line? The slope of the tangent line is the same as the derivative, which is the same as f prime of 1, which we just figured out was 1 fourth. So if I want to be perpendicular to the tangent line, if I know that the tangent line has a slope of 1 fourth perpendicular to the tangent line, then would be, I call this m perpendicular. A little perpendicular symbol there. Okay, what does perpendicular mean? Two things you've got to remember. It's opposite and reciprocal. Maybe I should write a little note about that as a reminder. Perpendicular is two things. It's opposite and reciprocal of whatever you want to be perpendicular to. So if my tangent line is 1 fourth, then the opposite would be negative. Reciprocal would be 4 over 1 would be negative 4. Okay, so now I can go over here and I can fill in that my slope needs to be negative 4. But we still need a point. We still need a point here. So I somehow have to find a point in all of this information. Well, they told me the point. They told me half the story, at least, of the point. They told me that x had to be 1. 
So if I know that x is 1, if I told you what the x is for an equation, how would you figure out what the y is? We plug it in. We plug it in, and we actually already figured that out over here, that f of 1 was 1 over 1 plus 1, which ended up being 1 half. All right, now we have all the information that we need, and we can write our equation. In, it just said find an equation, so we can write our equation in any form that we want. I'm going to choose Taylor form. I like Taylor form the best. That's y equals y1, which would be 1 half, plus the slope, which would be subtract 4, and then x minus x1. All right, now this is big, so I'm going to repeat it again. I'm going to go through this whole process one more time. Find the equation, boom, right there. You should be thinking of two things. If I want to write the equation, I need the slope and a point. I need the point and a slope. I need the slope and a point. I need the point and a slope. Now, to do that, I'm going to go to the normal line. The normal line is something new or a newish phrase that means perpendicular to the tangent line. So for us to figure out the tangent line, we had to go back and do our derivative, which luckily we did all the work on the derivative already. Going forward, we're going to learn a shortcut, so it's a lot quicker to find the derivative to these. But we found the tangent of the derivative by doing the derivative by definition. Tangent of the, of the, of the curve. I shouldn't have said tangent of the derivative. Tangent is the derivative. They're the same thing. So the tangent at x equals negative 1 had a slope of 1 fourth because the derivative at 1 was 1 fourth. So now I can take the perpendicular to that, which is opposite and reciprocal. And then we could take the point and the slope and make them into an equation. Oh, and I found the point by plugging in x for 1. 1 for x. All right, so here's a couple of big ideas. There are two types of rates of change. Everything in the first box is equivalent. It's like if I said, find the slope. If I said, find the rise over the run. If I said, find delta x, delta y over delta x. Those all mean the same thing. If I said, find the zeros, find the solutions, find the roots. Those all mean the same things. So in the world of calculus, when we want to figure out the slope of the secant line. Secant line is the line that has, the secant line is the line that has how many points? Has two points has two points. So the slope of the secant line, the slope formula, y minus y, they just did it in function notation, y minus y over x minus x, or this phrase, and I'm going to underline it, average, I'm going to do it, in, I was going to do that, what would show up really well. Um, average rate of change. The average rate of change, the slope, and the secant line all mean the same thing. Then when we take that slope and we try to figure out what's happening at the tangent line, the problem with the tangent line is how many points do we have? We only have this one point. So we can't do y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So to find the slope of the tangent line, what we do is we take the slope formula. This thing's called the difference quotient. And we try to figure out what the limit is as, as h approaches 0 of the difference quotient. In other words, we take that second point and we just make it closer and closer and closer and closer and closer and calculate the slopes. We also call this f prime. We also call this the derivative. And then the big one is that we call this the instantaneous rate of change. The average rate of change is between two values. It's on average what's happening to them. Instantaneously is what's specifically happening the moment that you're trying to look at at x equals c. These are worth memorizing. These phrases are worth looking at a couple of times. And I'm going to talk about them a lot, but hopefully you'll start to make the connection on what these three things because the wording will be different. The wording, one question might say slope of the secant line. The next one might write this. The next one might write this. And they all mean the same thing. Let me go back to this one, though. I do want to write a little note. This is just 
f of x2 minus f of x1 over x2 minus x1. This is just change in y over change in x. This is just y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. It's all the same thing written in its new fancy format. All right, so hopefully that, hopefully you believe me on the importance of those, um, these phrases. Now, from what I've seen on the AP test, they don't actually ask you very often to do the derivative by definition. What they do ask you is to recognize the function from the difference quotient. So what we want to do here is we want to identify, so each of the following represents the derivative of some function at some x equals c. Identify the function and what c is for each one of these, I call them difference quotients. All right, so what do you think the function is here? Well, I kind of look at this and I think back to this thing, the limit as h approaches 0 of f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. This is worth memorizing. That thing is worth memorizing. You use it a lot. So as I'm looking at this problem, who is the x plus h? I would say this is the x plus h, and then this is the also the x plus h. So to me, I've replaced now this and this with x plus h. That means that the original function then was just 5x squared minus x plus 7. Over here, you can also think about this as f of x, except we've taken out the x and we've replaced it with what? Twos. So that still fits with my equation, but that then also indicates that c is equal to 2. So what does this thing represent? This represents the derivative. Ah, I really wish I would have written this better. And I'll try it over here. I'll try it on the next one. So let's just box this in. Technically, this is all we were supposed to do is find f and find c. Okay, so what does this thing represent? This is equal to the derivative of f of x equals, all right, what's my function here? Well, I see this as the x plus h. Wait, 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 what happened to the minus f of x piece? Well, this would be the same as saying... Who is C in this case? Can you tell from looking? I can tell that this is C. So if, if I was to look at this, I think my function is tangent, and I think my C is pi over 4. Well, what's tangent of pi over 4? Go to your unit circle. Pi over 4 is here. Root 2 over 2 over root 2 over 2 is 1. So sometimes it's a little harder to see, but I, I struggle to teach this because you kind of just look at it and you just know f of x is equal to tangent of x at x equals what c value did they pick? Pi over 4. So this is the same as saying that limit that you evaluate is the same as saying the derivative of f of x equals tangent of x at x equals pi over 4. Let's have you try one. Pause and do the next one. Okay, let's see how it went. So I know it's not easy, but it's also, I don't know, it's, it's tough for me to teach because I think you just kind of can see it. This would say that my f of x is e to the x because it's e to the pi plus h, e to the pi. So e to the looks like my function. My c value would be pi. My function was e to the x. e to the pi is what I plugged in. e to the pi plus h is my first part of the difference quotient. And if this is a struggle for you, I'm happy to try to talk you through a couple more. I can come up with some more examples. Let's see if you can try the next one. Let's try to write the next one out, actually. This is represented by the derivative 
of f of x equals, okay, I'm going to have you pause here. Try to do this on your own. This is the derivative of f of x equals natural log of x at x equals 1. Now you might say, how, how is this true? How does this work? Well, I'll show you real quickly. Let's say that I actually tried to do the difference quotient on this function. So it would be the limit of natural log of 1 plus h. I knew I wasn't going to have enough room. The limit as h approaches 0 of natural log of x plus h minus natural log of x all over h, right? That's what I would get if I was doing the derivative by definition of the natural log function. Now we know that x equals 1, so these would become 1s. So then I would have a 1 here. And I would put a 1 here. And what have we learned that the natural log of 1 is? That's one of the two things they expect you to memorize. They expect you to know that e to the 0 is 1, and natural log of 1 is 0. So this is 0, so I get natural log of 1 plus h minus 0, which is gone, and that's where we got where we got. Okay, now we're going to talk about differentiability at a point. So before we talked about, um, last unit we talked about continuity at a point. So let's have pop quiz. What are the three things you need to prove continuity at a point? Go. Number one, the point exists. Number two, the limit exists. Number three, the point and the limit are at the same place. At the same, at share, are equal, are equals. That's how I should say that. So remember that if a function f of x has a derivative at a given point, then the function is called differentiable at that point. We also saw in example four how a function was defined, meaning and continuous, at x equals two, but was not differentiable there. That's referring back to this function. Is f continuous at x equals two? Yes, f is continuous, but it wasn't differentiable because when we got there, when we started to look at the slopes of the tangent lines, when we got to this one, we got a slope that was undefined, that was vertical. It turns out being continuous at a point is a necessary condition for differentiability, differentiability at that point, but not a sufficient condition. In other words, what that means is I want to make sure that I am, if I am continuous, let me try again. You can't be differentiable without being continuous, but being continuous is not enough to say that you're differentiable. So if a function f is continuous at x equals c, then it is also differentiable if the slopes from either side are approaching each other. So let's put a little highlight here. The limit from the left of what? Notice who are we taking the derivative? We're taking the derivative. We're looking at the derivative of the function equals L and the limit from the right of the derivative equals L. Then my function is um, differentiable at that point. Let me try that again. If I want to show that a function is differentiable at a point, I need to show that the one-sided derivatives, let's actually write that down. These are called one-sided derivatives are equal. So when we wanted to prove continuity, one of the things we had to prove was that the one-sided limits were equal. That proved that the overall limit existed. Now we're going to do the same thing with the derivative, but we're going to take it up a level. Instead of trying to show that the one-sided limits are equal, we're going to show that the one-sided derivatives are equal. All right. 
So in order to check, we need to check the both the y values and the slopes as they approach each other. We must now define a new limit definition rather of f prime as a function rather than a function. All right, so for me to figure out if my function is differentiable, I have to check two things. I have to check for continuity and I have to check for um, differentiability. So let's start with continuity here. So I would check the one-sided limits. Continu um, oh, no, no, let's just, sorry, sorry, we're going to do that in a minute. We're going to do that in a minute. We already know, let f be a continuous function. So that's kind of boring. So I'm going to skip the continuity part. We're just going to focus on differentiability for these two. What is the limit of f prime as x approaches negative 1 from the left? Okay, so this is, the, this is the function of all derivatives. As I come at it from the left, that means I'm going to look at this part. It means I'm going to direct substitute into here. We'd get negative 1. That'd be negative 3. That'd be plus 4. So from the left would be 1, right? Negative 3 plus 4 is 1. The limit of f prime of x as x approaches negative 1 from the right now I'm attacking it from this side. Now I'm putting negative 1 into this. Negative 1 squared is 1. Okay, so what does this mean? F is differentiable at x equals negative 1 because the limit of f prime of x as x approaches negative 1 from the left equals the limit of f prime of x as x approaches negative 1 from the right. The one-sided derivatives are equal. Now let's try this again for this function. Or actually, you should try it. Why don't you try it? Hit pause. All right, let's see how you did. So I need to look at the one-sided derivatives. Now what's nice about this is they've already done the derivative for us. In the next couple examples, we're going to have to do the derivative on our own. So the derivative of negative 1, so I plug it in there, that would be natural log of, of 1, which that's the one that they expect you to memorize. Natural log of 1 is 0. The limit of f prime of x as x approaches negative 1 from the right, that'd be in this one. I plug in negative 1, so that'd be negative pi. That would take me over there, which would be negative 1. We have a problem here. The one-sided derivatives are not equal. So I would now say f is not differentiable at x equals negative 1 because the limit of f prime of x as x approaches negative 1 from the left does not equal the limit of f prime of x as x approaches negative 1 from the right. The write-up is half the battle, but if you know what you're doing, if you've got this thing wrapped around in your head about how limits work, it should be pretty straightforward. This should feel a lot like what we did with continuity, except we're not looking at f anymore. We're now looking at f prime. All right, all right, all right. Where's the one that I wanted? Eh. All right, let's do this. Let me see here. I feel like this is kind of out of place. So this is another form of the derivative. The de ugh. This is another form of the definition of the derivative. So this is another way to look at it. Yet again, this is not one that I memorized, but it, it's it's kind of nice. It's it's fairly simple. It's actually kind of nice, but um, anyway, I don't think it's worthwhile to memorize a bunch of different formats, but it's up to you. So f prime of one. 
So if I wanted to find f prime of 1 for this, I would do the derivative by definition, and then at the end, I would plug in 1. Or, as I'm doing the derivative by definition, I would plug in 1. Where did this problem go? So like we did here, as I was doing the derivative by definition, instead of doing f of x plus h, I did f of 1 plus h. I just plugged it right in. This is another form. This is another option, another way you could do that. But then you've got to memorize how this works. So it's up to you. I, I, I'll show it to you, and you can decide if you like it. So f prime of 1 equals, okay. So now, what have we figured out? Everything that is labeled as a c in this formula is going to become a 1. And f of x is simply the function f of x. So my limit as x approaches who? c, so x approaches 1, of f of x, which is x over x plus 1, minus f of c, so that's this function, that's this function with 1 plugged into it, so that would be 1 over 1 plus 1, which is 2, so I get 1 over 2, over x minus, and then c is 1. So if I plug 1 into this, never not first, you direct substitute, you'd get 0 over 0, which means that there's a hole. I expect you to know how to clean this up by now. So I'm going to give you 10 seconds. I want you to actually see how far you can get on your own. So pause it and then unpause it and come back to me and see how you're doing. So first thing I want to do is kill off these fractions. So I'm going to times by 2, x plus 1 to the top and 2x plus 1 to the bottom. Pause it if you, haven't, if, you, if you needed that hint. Now that you've got the hint, pause it and try to take it from there. Okay, then my limit. I haven't been able to plug in 1 for x yet, so I have to write it out again. So when I distribute, the x plus 1 is going to cancel, but the 2 isn't. So I'm going to have 2 times x. When I distribute, the 2 is going to cancel, but the x plus 1 isn't, but I've got to remember to distribute the negative. And on the bottom, boy, I've got a lot of stuff going on down here. I'm not sure how this is going to work out. So I've got a 2, so I'm not going to put any of it together. So I'm going to leave it like that for now. And I might come back to it. We'll see. Okay, so now I'm going to start to pause again if you needed that hint. All right, so I haven't been able to plug in 1 yet, so I'm going to still write out my limit. I'm going to clean up my numerator. 2x minus x is 1x. Oh, I'm in good shape now. What do you notice I have in the numerator and denominator? There's my problem. There's my hole. So that's going to leave a 1 on the top. Well, actually, I can just do that here. 1 over, I don't need this. And I can also direct substitute because we eliminated the problem. So that's 2. 2 times 2 is 4. I would get 1 fourth. So we have now proven that f prime of 1 equals 1 fourth in an alternate method. I mean, that was the same thing we got when we did it by uh, definition and then just plugged in the 1. So like I said, if you want to try it this way, go for it. If you want to try... Um, this format, yet again, so this is the application of it. If I'm, What I'm trying to do is I'm trying to look at this, and I'm trying to decide what my function must be to end up, and then what my constant must be. So kind of like what we did before, where we looked and tried to figure out, like what we did here, where we looked and tried to figure out what the uh, derivative was, what we did here, what's f and what's c. Let's see if you can figure this one out on your own. What do you think in example 9a? Just try it. See what you think. So remember how this format looks. The first thing is your function. So the first thing is my function. So what's the first thing we see? x minus 2 cubed. So that's my function. So f of x is equal to x minus 2 cubed. Okay, then what is c? How do we figure out what c is? Well, c is there's two ways to think about it. It's the number that you would plug in. Ah, let's just think about it this way. 
it's the number that you would plug in here for whatever you plugged in for x. So if I have, if x is already, no, 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 sorry, 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 let me try again. x minus c, so whatever's down here with x, that's what c is. So if this says x minus 5, then c must be 5. You try the next one. This thing is my function. In this format, that's my function. So f of x equals the square root of x plus 9. This is whatever my c value is. So then I'm subtracting. It's supposed to be subtract. So if it's a plus, that means it must be a negative. So I got c equals negative 3. Honestly, I do not remember seeing a lot of problems with this alternate form of the derivative by definition. I mean, it's worth talking about, but I don't know how often you're going to see it. Okay, so now I want to decide. You know what? Let's stop here, and then I'll come back. No, no, no. I think this makes sense to do this next one. This next one is the one that I thought I was doing earlier, so I think it makes sense to tie it in here. Okay, so how do we prove? Remember how we did how we proved continuity at a point. So how do we prove differentiability at a point? So what do we need to prove? Number one, you can't be differentiable if you're not continuous. So I have to prove continuity first. Number one, prove continuity. Okay, so then I'm not going to go over that again. There are three steps. I'll put it in parentheses. Three conditions, we should call them, not steps. Three conditions of continuity that you need to prove. And then number two, I need to prove differentiability. To prove differentiability, I have to prove, I only have one condition. that the one-sided what derivatives are equal so if i prove that my function is continuous and i prove that my one-sided derivatives are equal then i have proven differentiability all right so let's get after it you should be able to do the first point figure out continuity for this function Number one, f of 1 is clearly the thing that we're trying to prove. Well, yeah, it's a differentiability at 1. So what is f of 1? Well, I would plug 1 into this piece of my piecewise function, plug in negative or plug in 1, that'd be negative 3. Negative 3 plus 1 is negative 2. Number two, the limit of f of x as x approaches where? As x approaches 1 from the left, and the limit of f of x as x approaches 1 from where? From the right. Remember how we do this. So I would look at the piece of the function that's coming at 1 from the left side. And that would be this piece, which we already plugged in, turned out to be negative 2. Then I would plug it into the piece that comes from the other side. So that's 1 minus 1 is 0. Negative 2 times 1 is negative 2. Yay, life is good. Therefore, my limit of f of x as x approaches 1 equals negative 2. So what can we now say? We can now say f is continuous at x equals negative 2 because f of 1 equals the limit of f of x as x approaches 1. Now this time I chose not to put the negative 2 in there. And I, I could have. I, I just chose not to. I showed my work over here that, that are all equal to negative 2. That was my call, and I made it. All right. Now we want to prove differentiability. So that means I have to show that the one-sided derivatives are equal. So what is the one-sided derivative of this? What is f prime of this? Um, shoot, how much do I want to spend on <laughs>
Well, let's practice it. Let's practice it one more time. So I'm going to practice the derivative by definition. So f prime of, of this would be the limit as h approaches 0 of negative 3 times x plus h plus 1 minus f of x, which would turn that into a plus 3x and a minus 1 all over h. Actually, you know what I could do is I could just plug 1. I should have plugged 1 in there. And then I could just figure out directly. I'm going to do the derivative and then plug 1 in at the end. On the other one, I'll go with the alternate form. So the limit as h approaches 0, I would distribute. So we'd get negative 3x minus 3h plus 1 plus 3x minus 1 all over h. What should happen here? Stuff should cancel. So as I look to see what things cancel, um, minus 3x plus 3x plus 1 minus 1, h over h cancels, and I'm left with, oh, this one's easy, just negative 3. Okay, so what I have figured out now is I can now go down here, and I can say that the, lim the limit... How do I want to say? I hope this doesn't get too crowded for you here. The limit of f prime of x as x approaches 1 from the left equals negative 3. Because what I did was I took the derivative of this and I figured out what the answer was at 1. So this would be the derivative from the left side. Now I'm going to do this again, but I'm going to do the derivative from the right. Excuse me from the right side. So, what would that look like? So now I'm going to do the limit as h approaches 0. Ugh, this one's going to be a little bit uglier. Why don't you try to do it? Pause it. I'll do it with you. But pause it. See how far you can get without me. So that should be the first part, the derivative by definition. So I took out all the x's and replaced them with x plus h. Oh, I said I was going to do the shortcut. Darn it, I should have put 1's in there. Dang it. Oh, well, too late now. Okay, so actually I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write it over the top. So I, that's not good for you, but it is good for me. I'm going to try to do it that way next year. So I'm going to put the 1 right in there. 1, 1, 1, and 1. So that's a 1. That's a 1. So I would then start to expand this thing, the limit, as h approaches 0. So you might be getting x's. Wherever you get an x is where I'm going to get a 1. So I would distribute 1 plus h squared. I'm not going to show my work on this. This is a 1, 2, 1. 1 times 1 is 1. 1h plus 1h is 2h h times h is h squared, minus 2 times 1 is 2, minus 2h, two and then I've got a minus 1, a minus 1, a plus 2, and a plus 1, all over h. The limit as h approaches 0, okay, so let's see what we can cancel out here. Lots of stuff should cancel. So I've got, oh boy plus 2h, minus 2h, minus 2, plus 2, plus 1, minus 1, minus 1, plus 1, sweet. So now I have, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Hold on, something blew up. I got to pause for a second. We're okay, we're okay, we're okay. So then what am I left with? I'm left with h squared over h, which I can kill 1h, which leaves me with the limit 
as h approaches 0 of h. Now we can direct substitute. So I can put that 0 in for h, and I get 0. So what does this mean? This means that the limit of the derivative as x approaches 1 from the right is equal to 0. This is a problem. Now, this will be a lot easier. Those of you who have taken physics and already know the shortcut, we're going to get to the spot where we can do this all by the shortcut. I wanted to do it the long way one more time. But what we've now proven is that the limit of the derivative, the one-sided derivative from the left is negative 3. The one-sided derivative from the right is 0. Our graph is not smoothly connected. So this, tie, this side of the graph this side of the graph comes in at a slope of negative 3. This side of the graph comes in at a slope of 1. Now they hit. They hit. But we have what's called a sharp turn at that, spo at that spot. Sharp turn. So even though f is continuous, I guess i got to write it way up here in the corner. f is not differentiable at x equals 1 because the limit of the derivative as x approaches 1 from the left equals negative 3, which doesn't equal 0, which is the limit of the function of, sorry, of the derivative as x approaches 1 from the right. So I'm guessing we might have some questions in class on this one. So feel free to talk a little bit more. We'll try to find some examples to do together. But I, this is where we're going to stop here today.